welcome to the Madden America podcast, your source for science, psychiatry, and social justice. Welcome to the Madden the Family podcast. I'm Miranda Spencer, Family Resources Editor. Our guest today is Shira Collings, MSNCC. Shira is Madden America's Assistant Editor for MIA Continuing Education. She's also the Youth Coordinator for the National Empowerment Center and an eating disorder therapist. She received her BA in communication from the University of Pennsylvania and an MS in counseling and psychology from Troy University. As a person with lived experience of recovery from diet culture, disordered eating, and trauma, Shira is passionate about supporting others in finding freedom with food, body acceptance, and the ability to be their full authentic selves and live according to their values. She is an advocate for trauma-informed, person-centered approaches to mental health care. Welcome, Shira. Hi, thanks so much for having me. So our topic for discussion today is person-centered approaches to helping youth with eating disorders. Um, Eating problems are said to be one of the most deadly mental health issues, and there are many different types listed in the psychiatry's diagnostic manual. So why are there so many different emotional behavioral issues associated with nutrition and eating. Is there some kind of underlying thread to this? Yeah. um, So I think one commonality and underlying thread that's present in every eating disorder and every diagnosis is restriction. People respond to restriction in different ways. So I think most, if not all eating disorders begin with a period of caloric restriction, of weight suppression, Um, And sometimes people respond with more restriction and sometimes the restriction leads people's bodies to feel very deprived and they may respond through binging or through binging and purging as a result. And I think there's a lot of different factors that play a role in restriction, but a very common factor is body dissatisfaction and the social idealization of thinness and devaluation of fatness. So sometimes that's what leads someone to restrict in the first place. And other times someone may lose weight unintentionally. Um, For example, that might be through a physical illness or other factors. um, And they may get praised for that or reinforced for that in some way. And that kind of prompts more restriction or some sort of disordered eating cycle. Um, And I would also add that restriction leads to a host of emotional and behavioral issues um, that can impact someone's relationship with food and their body and other aspects of their life. Eating disorders are typically associated in a lot of people's minds with teenagers. Is that an accurate representation of the population that most struggles with this type of issue? And if not, what range for children and youth tends to be the most affected? Um, So eating disorders affects people of all ages. There's no age group that's not affected. Um, I think a common stereotype is that eating disorders only affect children, youth, and teenagers when that's not the reality. All age groups can struggle. Um, It is most commonly recognized in adolescents and teens for a variety of reasons. One of those reasons, I think, is that stereotype. Um, And because of that stereotype, medical providers may screen for it in adolescents and teens and stop screening for it in adulthood. But eating disorders often develop in adolescence. So recognizing and treating them at that point is really important. Um, And if we can recognize them in youth and kind of start the treatment there, that can really prevent it from becoming a lifelong issue. Right. Why does it tend to start in adolescence? What is about adolescence that makes one, I don't know, um, self-conscious about one's body or what? I think it's different for so many people, but I do think many mental health issues that people struggle with often start in adolescence. So I don't know that there's anything different about eating disorders. And again, I think they can potentially start at any age. I think sometimes they commonly start in adolescence because that's when people are sometimes dealing with figuring out their identity or navigating um, who they are, what groups they belong to, dealing with different dynamics with their peers. Um, So for sure, that can kind of influence people and result in restriction or body dissatisfaction. I think if people are involved in activities too that place a high 
emphasis on appearance and on um, body weight, such as sports or dance, um, that kind of thing, that can definitely lead to restriction or lead to disordered eating. Um, and then sometimes it has to do with family messaging or family attitudes. But yeah, I, I think it's there. It's not unique to eating disorders. That kind of raises the question that if there's going to be some kind of issue displayed in adolescence, why it ends up being an, an eating issue rather than something else. What do we know or not know about the origins of disordered eating in terms of especially how much of a role does parent and family, maybe eating behavior or attitudes tend to play versus social pressures like uh, bullying or Instagram messages, such as the recent news reports about the negative effect of Instagram on teen girls' mental health? Yeah, so I think it's different for everyone. Um, I think all of that that you mentioned certainly plays a role um, or can play a role. So negative messaging from families, schools, peers, and the media, those certainly can have a big impact. Um, But I think it's just different for everyone in terms of what maybe has the most impact or what maybe doesn't have as much of an impact. I guess that makes it more challenging in terms of helping someone because it's not like you can kind of go to a script of it's caused by this. And so the solution is, is that is kind of what I hear you saying. Yeah, I think that's true. Um, at the same time, I do think there are things that we know do play a role in our major contributors, such as um, restriction or weight suppression. Um, So that's definitely something that we can kind of keep coming back to just the effects of that. And we do know that negative messaging in general, it doesn't have to be in a specific setting or we don't even we don't always have to know the specific setting that the negative messaging is taking place in to kind of just address the fact that negative messaging about bodies and about eating and about weight do play a role and can lead to that restriction. Yeah. So are there any stereotypes or beliefs about eating struggles that need to be corrected in the public eye? So yeah, I think a very common stereotype is that eating disorders only affect white, thin girls, um, teenage or adolescent girls. But the reality is that eating disorders affect people of all sizes, backgrounds, ages, ethnicities, sexual orientations, and genders. I think one of the most harmful stereotypes is that people in larger bodies don't have eating disorders or restrictive eating disorders, um, or that you can tell by looking at someone whether or not they have an eating disorder or maybe the severity or the type of their eating disorder. Um, I think it's really important to acknowledge that weight suppression and restriction in any size body can be very harmful. And we do have research showing, for example, that someone in a larger body who's lost a significant amount of weight rapidly may be suffering from more medical consequences that someone, than someone who's categorized as underweight, according to the BMI, but who was in a smaller body to start with. Um, so we really just can't tell by looking at someone. Right. Well, you mentioned restriction quite a bit, but when you think of people with larger bodies, the association or assumption would be binging or just excessive feeding. Um, But is that not necessarily the case? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, Many people in larger bodies struggle with restrictive eating disorders. Um, And again, I think what really can determine medical severity of an eating disorder and some of the health consequences is often the amount of weight lost or the amount of weight suppression sometimes the rapidness of the weight loss rather than like the actual body weight. So someone may be in a larger body, but maybe their natural body weight or what they started out as um, really needs to be a much higher weight than what they're in. And so that can be very harmful because they're still weight suppressed. They're still at a lower weight than they need to be. Versus maybe someone who's underweight, according to the BMI, you know, there might still need to be weight restoration and refeeding, but maybe it's not as severe. They're not facing as severe medical consequences because they were in a smaller body to start with. And I would also add that binge eating disorder um, 
or disorders that we commonly associate with eating quote, like excessively, um, those often, if not always result from restriction. Um, that's usually one way that restriction affects the body. And it's a way that the body is kind of making sure to get enough food or to kind of compensate for the deprivation that it's facing from restriction and for the starvation that it's experiencing. So I, I would also add that, that even the eating disorders that maybe in our popular culture, we don't consider restrictive are still restrictive eating disorders that the approach to treating like binge eating disorder, for example, is through addressing the restriction, not through addressing the binging behaviors. That's really interesting because I, I think about popular diets right now, like keto, which is quite restrictive. You can have almost no carbs and it's mostly protein. And you're very focused on making sure that you only eat certain things. Is is that it's kind of where do we draw the line on what is a choice and what gets into the territory of um kind of unacknowledged emotional distress? Yeah. I mean, I personally don't really draw that line. We have evidence, plenty of evidence showing this, that any form of restriction, including a diet that's normalized or popularized in our culture, um, can be harmful and can create real mental and physical health consequences. Um, and we do have evidence showing that keto has resulted in many, many different types of physical health issues, mental health issues, has, I, I believe it's resulted in death in some cases, which is really tragic. Um, so I definitely think that just because a diet is normalized or seen as even the right thing to do or something healthy, we do, we do know that it can be very harmful and that it's important to recognize that. That's really interesting. And struggles around food and eating are considered a mental health problem, but you've also told me that disordered eating and basically malnutrition can actually cause or exacerbate mental health problems. Can you talk about that? Yeah, absolutely. I think the idea that an eating disorder or disordered eating results from like an underlying issue or means that someone has something wrong with their brain in the first place that's kind of leading them to do that. I think that's kind of a misconception or it's just a lot more complex and nuanced. Um, so I think that's really important to acknowledge that just restriction itself can cause problems. Um, and so the idea that it's a mental health issue that causes starvation versus starvation that causes a mental health issue, I think is a bit oversimplified. I really want to talk about a study called the Minnesota Starvation Experiment. That was a study done um, in World War II or the aftermath of World War II. Um, it was done to study how to refeed victims of genocide who were healing from the effects of starvation. Um, so what they did is they had 36 participants. Um, and this is a study that I want to acknowledge would not be approved by any research ethics committee today, um, really horrifically unethical experiment, but I think we can still learn a lot from it. So these 36 participants were selected for the experiment because they were in top psychological health. They were considered extremely physically healthy. They were just doing great, very high functioning, um, no problems with eating, no eating disorders, nothing like that, no mental health problems or diagnoses. They were conscientious objectors to World War II. That was, um, this was kind of how they um, chose to serve. They were put through a period of semi-starvation, um, which I believe was around 1,500 to 1,600 calories per day. They lost a significant percentage of their body weight. And I believe that was about six months. Um, and then after that, they went through refeeding, um, so kind of healing from that starvation. And these men deteriorated and had their mental health and physical health just destroyed, um, just absolutely devastated by starvation and by this period of, um, of significant restriction, which many diets today prescribe 
that number of calories or even less than that number of calories. So it's not even something today that we always recognize as starvation, but absolutely in this experiment, you can tell that their bodies and their brains did respond to it as if it were starvation. And it was. These participants experienced anxiety, like very high anxiety, very high irritability. They lost a lot of interest in social activities um, in like their romantic life and spending time with other people. They became obsessed with food. They collected cooking utensils sometimes or chewed tons of gum, like 50 packs of gum a day, I think in one case. They would look at like images of food. Some of them even became chefs, like switched careers after the experiment. They often had insomnia and couldn't sleep. There were neurological effects, gastrointestinal effects. Um, Some of them even had like psychotic symptoms. One was so kind of lost touch with reality or lost touch with the ability to function that he ended up chopping off three of his fingers during the experiment. Getting on a more personal level, how did you come to be interested in working with people with eating disorders since that is what you do? Um, So I've had my own lived experience of diet culture and disordered eating. um, And I've had family members and friends who have experienced that too. So that really sparked my passion for helping others with eating disorders. It's something that I've recovered from myself and Um, I've seen others recover from, and it's been just a really healing process. And really, I've seen how incredibly positive it can be to, to really break free from all of that and live the life that I and others want to live rather than the life that kind of is imposed by some of these values of diet culture and fat phobia. Um, So I really want to support others in doing that. Um, And I also really love that in the eating disorder field, there's such an important role for looking at systemic factors that contribute to disordered eating and supporting people in unlearning what they've been taught um, about maybe needing to control their body size or needing to shrink their bodies. Um, I really believe that in many ways, eating disorder recovery is about rejecting oppressive values in our culture and really living according to your own values and according to non-oppressive values, social justice aligned values. And I really love supporting people in that. So historically, what have been the standard approaches to treating eating problems? And what are some of their limitations in your experience? I do know that one traditional approach historically has been separating people from their families and assuming that families kind of were the sole cause of eating disorders. Um, and just kind of treating um, the person with the eating disorder as just an individual, not including their family, um, and really like encouraging disconnection from their family. And I think a limitation of that is that families can be really helpful sources of support in someone's recovery, and it can be really valuable to include them in the process. Um, I do think it's important to acknowledge that families do sometimes contribute to eating disorders. And sometimes they do play a role because of maybe their own eating habits, their own restriction, their own dieting, their own beliefs about body size. Um, But when families are willing to recognize that and unlearn it and help someone kind of recover from that together as a family, I think that can be an incredibly healing process. I know that there were some sort of sensational made for TV movies a couple of decades ago where the image of someone with an eating disorder as starving themselves and that they have to be hospitalized and kind of force fed, um, which which seems excessive. But it is is that common or is that no longer done or was it ever done? Um, I think it's significantly less common than the media portrays it to be. I think it's really important to remember that the media is, you know, designed to like be sensational and create viewership. And so it's not, it's going to portray kind of the most extreme cases that really aren't necessarily representative of what eating disorder treatment and recovery look like. Um, I think it's a lot more common unfortunately, for people with eating disorders to not even have 
their eating disorders recognized or get treatment at all, which is incredibly unfortunate and devastating. Um, But I think that's often because we have this idea that if someone is not quote underweight or underweight, according to the BMI um, or really emaciated looking, then they're not struggling or their eating disorder isn't severe. It's not an important issue when we do really know that again, weight suppression and restriction can have an impact at any body size, but that's often just not talked about um, in our culture. And so medical providers, mental health providers often just don't recognize that, or it's kind of trivialized or minimized. Um, So I, I think that's kind of the more common scenario is that people aren't getting treatment when they need it. So what are some of the approaches that you like to use? And does your lived experience with the problem inform how you interact with your clients? Yeah. Um, So I primarily use feminist therapy. I believe really strongly that it's important to explore the systemic and cultural factors that contribute to eating disorders, um, which is kind of what feminist therapy is about. It's exploring, obviously, the effects of misogyny and patriarchy on our mental health, but also um, other forms of oppression, systemic racism, transphobia, homophobia, all sorts of different forms of bias that we have. Um, Obviously, with eating disorders, fat phobia and weight stigma are really relevant. Um, So I typically um, kind of use that a lot, use that lens to really explore what the impact of that has been in people's lives and um, how that is affecting their relationship with food. Um, My work is also informed by an approach called body trust, which is a paradigm for treating eating disorders and disordered eating. And that really emphasizes unlearning oppressive messages about our body and about weight. Um, And kind of, as its name suggests, trusting our bodies to regulate its weight um, and regulate our eating and be the size and shape that our bodies need to be without us needing to really um, control it and without us needing to kind of prescribe Um, a set of norms or values around what it should or shouldn't be, just kind of accepting what it naturally is when we don't play a hand in controlling it. I work a lot on externalizing shame. So I think a lot of people with eating disorders and disordered eating tend to blame their bodies and punish their bodies for issues that our culture kind of creates. Um, So really restricting our bodies and depriving our bodies from food and nourishment and other forms of self-care in order to conform to diet culture or to patriarchal standards. So I really emphasize like externalizing that and placing the blame in systems that have told us that our bodies are wrong and have told us that we need to change our bodies in some way um, rather than punishing our bodies. And I think just kind of getting in touch with anger and getting in touch with our feelings about maybe the actual systemic problem rather than almost suppressing those feelings or masking those feelings by blaming them on our bodies can be really important. Is there research on this approach on its success or um, has that not been done yet and it's um, more qualitative where you notice that this is effective? Yeah, it's more qualitative um, where I and my supervisors and many other providers have noticed that it's effective. I'm not sure how much quantitative research there is as it is a newer approach um, and I believe developed more recently. Um, I know we're going to talk about health at every size in a little bit and body trust is definitely informed by health at every size. There is a lot of research on health at every size and how effective that is. It's an evidence-based practice. Um, There is also research on feminist therapy and just how effective. Well, why don't you tell us more about health at every size? Yeah. So again, it's an evidence-based paradigm for treating eating disorders. Um, It recognizes that weight is not indicative of health. Um, So it looks at body size diversity as just kind of a natural part of diversity, same as height, just kind of like we're meant to be different heights. We're meant to have different shoe sizes. Um, We're meant to have different hair colors and skin colors and things like that. Um, In the same way, we're meant to have different size bodies. Um, Some people are meant to have larger bodies. 
And some people are meant to have smaller bodies and that is okay. It acknowledges that weight stigma is actually more dangerous and carries more risk than being at a higher body weight. So I do know this kind of goes against a lot of what people have been told. Um, People are kind of told that size diversity isn't a good thing or isn't a natural thing, that being at a higher weight um, carries risk or is associated with many different health problems. Um, But health at every size kind of recognizes that many of the health issues that we may associate with being at a higher weight may very well be due to weight stigma. It also recognizes that efforts to control our weight um, can be very damaging and have significant impacts. And some of those efforts um, may actually account for some of the health issues that we typically attribute to being at a higher weight. People in larger bodies are often prescribed eating disorder behaviors, such as dieting and restricting, even compensatory behaviors, like things that are called detox. I think um, for people in larger bodies that may be um, seen as like dieting or a healthy behavior, but for people in smaller bodies that may be seen as, um, as like an, a behavior of like bulimia or anorexia. So health at every size kind of recognizes that maybe some of the health issues that we associate with being at a higher weight may kind of result from some of those disordered eating behaviors that we often prescribe or seen as, or see as valuable or good in people in larger bodies. And it also recognizes that weight stigma is extremely prevalent, specifically in healthcare settings and in medical settings. And there's tons of research showing that medical providers um, treat uh, larger patients significantly worse than patients in smaller bodies. And that can cause a mental health problem because if your own doctors and everyone around you is putting you down, I could see where that would really do a number on your self-esteem and your sense of hope. And Absolutely. And it can also cause a physical health problem because there are many people in larger bodies may just not get healthcare, not get healthcare that they need because they don't want to go to a doctor's office and face systemic fat phobia. Um, And so we have this idea that fatness is unhealthy or fatness is associated with these health issues when we're not looking at these variables that maybe, you know, these associations might be due to the effects of weight stigma and specifically to the effects of not being able to get healthcare that's actually effective. This all is going to be very important for parents and family members that hear this because I think it seems kind of counterintuitive to what we've all sort of been taught. So, you know, if a parent is saying, you know, my kid is a lot heavier than the other kids and maybe I should, you know, make sure he only eats celery and, you know, that could be the worst possible thing, it sounds like. Absolutely. So as a practitioner in the field of disordered eating, um, is there something that you have learned from your clients? Yes, absolutely. I constantly am learning from my clients. I really think the biggest thing that I've learned is how pervasive weight stigma is um, and diet culture, which um, I don't know if I've defined. So just to kind of define those, it's the idea that thinness is better, healthier, or more valuable than fatness, um, and that we should be pursuing um, being thinner and controlling our body size, and we should be eating based on that rather than based on what our body wants and needs. And these are just so pervasive and commonplace and incredibly hard to escape from. And I'm constantly learning from my clients just how hard it is to recover in that kind of world where that's so pervasive, where every day they are fighting to let go of that control over their body size and have a positive relationship with all foods and accept that their body is going to be where it wants to be rather than, um, you know, judging by the BMI where it needs to be. Um, so I really have learned from them just how much strength it takes to recover. And I'm really in awe of them in a lot of ways. I would also add, you know, cause that's something I kind of knew from my lived experience, um, diet culture, certainly, played a role in my own disordered eating and 
my own disabled identity um, played a big role in that too, that I feel like I was often told to restrict certain foods or um, yeah, kind of eliminate certain things and that would somehow cure my disability or make me better that I wasn't trying hard enough if I wasn't doing those things. Um, so I certainly knew like how hard it was to recover, um, in that culture, but I've learned how much harder it is. The more marginalized identities you have, I do, I'm a person who has thin privilege. I have white privilege, Um, I have relative financial privilege. A lot of my clients don't. And I I think there are certain marginalized identities where it just becomes very hard to recover because um, restoring weight might add another form of stigma that you have to experience, another form of discrimination that might be part of your day-to-day life in addition to everything else you're experiencing. So as an example, if someone is a person of color, Um, And they're obviously facing systemic racism and the threat of police brutality, hiring discrimination, workplace things um, that can all increase if they're weight restoring and they weight restore into a larger body that's deemed at a higher weight by our culture seen as too large, like then they're facing that kind of intersecting oppression. Um, So that's definitely something that I've become a lot more aware of and a lot more aware of the need to acknowledge and the need to just really validate and empathize with. And again, yeah, just how much strength it takes to kind of even be thinking about recovery when that's what your experience is. So in terms of practical advice, particularly for parents and family members with teenagers and youth who um, have mental health issues that manifest through an eating disorder or who an eating disorder or food relationship is causing mental health issues, what would be some of your do's and don'ts for family members looking at a young person? So the first thing I would say um, is that it's really important to approach the issue holistically. Um, so to involve a dietitian and doctor, in addition to a therapist, um, for eating disorder treatment, it's really important to kind of take that multidisciplinary approach, um, because like you said, and I really appreciate your phrasing of that question to acknowledge that often it's not really necessarily so much a mental health problem that manifests through an eating disorder as much as the other way around, like starvation and weight suppression, manifesting as mental health issues. So that component of getting medical care and of seeing a dietitian and making sure that someone really is being fully weight restored and being fully refed um, is so important. I think often people don't reach full weight restoration or um, they're kind of in a space that we sometimes call quasi recovery where maybe they're at a quote, normal BMI or average BMI, but they're really not, that's still too low for what their body needs to be. And so they still end up really struggling with an eating disorder, with other mental health issues when having a dietitian and a medical doctor involved can really help make sure that they get to the body weight and to the amount of refeeding that their body needs. So I think it's really important for parents and families to really acknowledge um, the impact of weight suppression and starvation and acknowledge that it's very, very hard for any type of mental health issue or issue with disordered eating um, to kind of be reduced or to be worked on without that, without those kind of basic human needs being met. I think there's a nutrition element in this too, aside from weight restoration, is that if you are have some kind of restricted eating, you just might not be getting certain micronutrients. So, I mean, I can imagine maybe a dietitian or physician would, you know, do the occasional blood test to make sure that you're, you know, have that because things like B12 are 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 missing. That can really affect the uh, your mental health. Correct? Yeah, absolutely. I think that's so important to acknowledge. And at the same time, I think we sometimes focus so much on that that we miss that like calories are also like nutritionally so, so needed. Like they're the most important thing. Our body's top nutritional priority is to get enough food and enough macronutrients. So we need 
fat, carbs, protein, like all of it. So I, I think sometimes um, I hear a focus on nutritional mental health. I think one reason that I'm bringing this up really on this podcast um, and in this particular space is that sometimes there can be a real focus on nutritional mental health, which I think can be valuable. I don't want to take that away from people who find that helpful. Um, and again, there's some intersection here too, but sometimes it's so focused on micronutrients or on, you know, getting fruits and vegetables or other things that maybe we as a culture have deemed healthy that we miss that like the first nutritional priority is enough calories and enough energy and enough of those macronutrients, um, like fat and carbs are really, really needed. I think absolutely having blood work, you know, every so often, often monthly or weekly, um, having vitals checked, like that's so incredibly important. Um, cause the other thing is that sometimes with restriction, someone can appear like medically okay for a certain amount of time. And it seems like everything is fine. Maybe they're functioning okay in their life. But then at some point they're not like the impacts can be accumulative and it can be sudden or it can be more sudden than is expected. So it can be really important to just make sure that they're being medically monitored and that we are kind of watching out for those signs that maybe things are deteriorating because the medical consequences are very real. In terms of what to look for, how can parents distinguish what we might call disordered eating from less than ideal eating, like a, just the American junk food diet, at, or distinguish disordered eating from perhaps allergies, food sensitivities, something like celiac disease? It's it's kind of like, how do you know when to worry or not worry? Yeah. So I would say that any form of restriction can be really harmful. Um, and it's definitely worth getting support around. Obviously, if there are like legitimate medical reasons and allergies um, and things that kind of need to be restricted for that reason, that that's um, reasonable, that needs to be recognized. But outside of that, um, I really do feel like any form of restriction that you see, any form of eliminating foods or even just fear or anxiety about foods, even if it's not a physical restriction, but it's more of like a mental or emotional restriction, I would say it can be really beneficial to get support around that. And I would say that that actually does include thinking about food as junk food um, or any type of kind of negative phrasing that we might use around food. Um, So I, I really appreciate kind of you bringing up that question um, around, um, quote, like a typical American junkie diet. Cause I think that actually that's, that's a type of phrasing or a type of conceptualization of food that the eating disorder field would kind of try to move away from and say that that might be really harmful to be thinking about food in that way. Um, cause that is a form of restriction and all foods really do have value. All foods really do provide energy or fat, carbs, or protein to our body. So yeah, and so we need all of that. Um, And so when you see kids or really anyone start to kind of think of food that way as like junk food or start saying this is unhealthy or start saying I want to eat less of this, um, that's really a sign of concern that can really lead to disordered eating pretty quickly. Um, So I would definitely suggest kind of seeing an eating disorder provider or getting some support. And I think other kind of signs to look for can include a preoccupation with like body image or intense body dissatisfaction, which includes any kind of pursuit of weight loss or wanting to lose weight. Um, I think that that often really does a lot of harm and can lead to a pretty dangerous path. Um, Any kind of focus in general on appearance or body um, and then I think social withdrawal in general is, can be a warning sign. If, if you see that with restriction of food, those are often linked, um, as well as irritability and other mood changes. That's often how restriction, um, initially kind of affects someone's mental health. And also what should parents say or not say? Yeah, I, I do think, you know, more often than not, um, that is 
really harmful for teenagers to experience any kind of um, weight stigma or kind of positive language about thinness, negative language about fatness or larger bodies. Um, and I think that can lead to dieting, which can quickly turn into disordered eating. So yeah, I definitely think that's something to avoid. I think in general, just like talking negatively about bodies or even maybe talking positively when the focus is on appearance can be really harmful. Um, I think a really big thing to avoid is any kind of praise around weight loss um, or any kind of negative talk about weight gain. I think it's really important to just more generally be neutral about bodies, just that, you know, bodies can be trusted to be the size and shape they need to be. And, you know, it's not good or bad. It's just where pot, where people's bodies need to be the same as someone's height or hair color. It's just kind of part of their appearance part of them. I think another big thing to avoid is categorizing foods as healthy or unhealthy. Um, just kind of, as I mentioned, really looking at all foods, having value, all foods, providing something important to the body. Um, and then I think another really big thing to avoid is, um, talking about exercise as a way to compensate for or earn food or as something that has to be done to be healthy. Cause I think that often makes people feel like they have to earn their food somehow, or that they have to eat less or control their food intake if they're not exercising or maybe exercise compulsively. And then I think another really big thing is just to um, not downplay how critical it is to eat enough and have enough body fat or body weight. I think that's a big issue that I see that maybe isn't talked about enough, just that um, we tend to just maybe think that it's not that important or that it's not a big deal if maybe a kid or an adult isn't eating enough um, or isn't at their body's weight that it needs to be at. Um, and then on the flip side, we kind of have a lot of fear mongering and panic about potentially eating too much or being over a certain weight um, when in reality, like the health consequences of under eating and being below where your body needs to be are much greater than kind of the other way and kind of maybe binge eating or overeating or things like that often come from that place of restriction. So I think that's just really important to really focus on that um, and emphasize just the importance of eating enough the same way we do with any other safety concern with kids that, you know, we want our kids to be safe and we want to teach them about what they need to do to be safe and to avoid potentially dangerous things. So I think this needs to be part of that conversation. What are your thoughts on the issue of weight gain from psychiatric medications? Because um, unfortunately, we're seeing more and more kids being put on psychiatric medications um, and these include the antipsychotic drugs, which do tend to have a lot of weight gain as well as other uh, health issues that they can potentially cause. Yeah, um, I'm glad you asked that because, again, that's kind of another type of thinking or conceptualization of weight that many spaces in the eating disorder field are moving away from. Just that idea of weight gain as a problem or as an issue. Um, I really think that the idea that weight gain is a problem in and of itself isn't really science-based. As we've talked about, I think there's lots of other issues that um, may account for the association between weight gain or between being in a larger body and some of the health issues that we attribute to that, um, whether that's weight stigma or um, being treated differently in a healthcare setting or not getting healthcare. Um, or disordered eating that results from that or results from being put on a restrictive diet or told to restrict. So I'm not sure that weight gain is a problem. Um, I do think that weight loss from psychiatric medication is a really big issue that we often don't talk about. I think, as I've mentioned, kind of having that energy deficit, um, the body feeling restric restricted, even if it's not intentional, that often does lead to disordered eating, whether that's more restriction or 
binge eating or a binge purge cycle. Um, and I have seen that happen as a result of psychiatric medication that maybe someone um, is under eating or restricting because of being put on maybe a stimulant for ADHD or something like that. And then um, as a result, they kind of sometimes are praised or reinforced for not eating or for losing weight because of that, because of kind of our cultural evaluation of that type of thing. And then that can lead to more disordered eating, kind of further attempts to restrict, or sometimes sometimes that just leads to the body feeling really deprived. And so that can lead to binge eating or binging and purging. But it's something that we often don't talk about or recognize as a factor. I also think another issue is that um, sometimes those same types of medications like stimulants um, are prescribed for binge eating disorder by maybe psychiatrists who aren't always very familiar with the eating disorder literature um, or with health at every size literature. They just kind of see someone in a larger body and maybe make an assumption that they're binge eating when they're not, or someone does report binge eating, but they don't look at, hey, is restriction causing this? And they just prescribe a stimulant. And then someone might kind of feel further restricted. And then that can end up leading to more binge eating. And so, and that can also just cause other health issues if, if weight suppression is happening because of that. Um, so I think that's not something we talk about enough. And I do want to emphasize, I'm not saying that I'm anti-stimulants ever being prescribed or that I'm anti-medication in any way, or that I think medication shouldn't be prescribed if weight loss could be a result. Um, but I just think that's not talked about enough. And because of our culture and because of fat phobia, we tend to really hyper focus on weight gain as an issue from psychiatric medication. And I think because of that, people don't realize that like maybe weight loss might be an issue that could cause disordered eating that they haven't been given like informed consent about or haven't been told how to manage if that happens. My last question is, you have said that eating disorders as a subspecialty in the mental health field is um, generally different from other subspecialties in mental health um, in a good way. And how is that? And what could the the psych fields um, take from that? Yeah, I do want to say, you know, the eating disorder field isn't perfect, um, as no field is. But I do feel that there's a lot more room than I've seen in other subspecialties to really acknowledge the impact of systemic and social factors on mental health and on our relationships with food and our bodies, um, and to really understand eating disorders as a social and systemic issue rather than purely an individual issue. Because I do think that the field really acknowledges the role that diet culture and fat phobia and patriarchy and other forms of oppression um, can play and how those can lead to people needing, feeling the need to control their body size and their body shape. And so I think that is something that I really learned from the eating disorder field and that, yeah, I, I wish other mental health professionals would kind of take into account. I think there's also a lot of acknowledgement of the role that starvation and weight suppression can play in mental health. I think, you know, it's, it's kind of a standard part of many different intakes um, in the mental health field to ask about how someone is sleeping or, you know, maybe if someone has been through trauma, that's starting to become a more standard part of our intakes, which is great. Um, or sometimes we ask about how often someone is exercising or different factors like that. Um, but we often don't talk about is someone eating enough? Is someone at the weight that their body really needs to be? Have they had a period of weight loss that might be impacting them in a negative way? So that's something I've taken from the eating disorder field that if someone isn't eating enough, if someone is weight suppressed, they really, a lot of mental health issues that they're experiencing may be attributable to that or um, that kind of addressing those issues as a priority can really reduce a lot of the symptoms that someone might be seeking help for. I also feel like um, there's just a lot of understanding that things that maybe we, other subspecialties tend to really pathologize or maybe stigmatize like anxiety, depression, irritability, um, suicidal ideation, even some 
psychotic symptoms. Um, I think there's understanding in the eating disorder field that those can be a result of starvation and weight suppression. So there's a focus on really refeeding and weight restoration before diagnosing or treating those other kinds of mental health issues. Get the body healthy first. Yeah, which I, I think is so important that, you know, so many times I've heard of people being given a really stigmatizing diagnosis that maybe impacts how they're treated going forward or access to healthcare, access to benefits, things like that, that maybe wasn't even an issue that, um, that they really had outside of how their body was responding to starvation. So I really like that in the eating disorder field, there's more room to kind of wait and see and not maybe give a diagnosis that might change how someone is treated, um, without waiting to see how their body responds to refeeding. So I, I really would love to see other providers just kind of learn from that and also kind of take that approach. Um, in general, I just feel like in our culture in mental health, we really rarely ask if someone is eating enough or resting enough. And I think doing both of those things can drastically improve our mental health and can just solve a lot of issues or just reduce um, how much different things affect us, um, improve our resilience to different things that are really hard to deal with right now and the world we live in. Um, so I would just love to see us recommend that in general um, before or in addition to more medicalized approaches. Right. And that sounds like it would be particularly important with children and youth. Absolutely. Yeah, that's so important. Like kids' bodies are constantly changing and constantly having to work, like to expend tons of energy to just grow and just like learn about the world and understand different things. It's hard to be a kid. And so, yeah, I feel like that's so important to just look at, are they given, are they being given what they need to do that rather than just kind of rushing to assume that there's something wrong with them? Thank you so much for joining us. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Our guest has been Shira Collings, MSNCC. I'm Miranda Spencer, and this has been Mad in the Family. Thank you for listening to the Mad in America podcast. Visit madinamerica.com for more news, views, and updates.